Hello and welcome to the 12th Beyond Biotech podcast, and it's the first one in September. It feels like the summer is over in some ways as events are just starting up again. I think a lot of people are going to be looking forward to getting back on the road. I'm just not really looking forward to the 6am flights. I'm Jim Cornell from La Biotech, and speaking of travel, I went to the nation's capital this week, Edinburgh, to do two interviews, both of which are for our special newsletter in September. We're hoping to do around 10 of those a year. You can find the list of them in our editorial calendar on the website. Which reminds me, speaking of events, we also now have an events and conference listing page on the labiotech.eu website. I really didn't realise when I was putting together the list that there are quite so many of them. Much as I'd like to go to them all, it's not really that realistic, especially since some of them are at the same time in different places. And eight events a month isn't really in the budget. If you know of any that we've missed in that list, please, of course, do let us know. So, as I was starting to tell you, I went to Edinburgh this week. It's a little under two hours drive, or at least it should be. The most direct route is usually pretty quiet, but I soon got behind a learner driver, which slowed me down a little bit, but then they went a different way, so I thought that was plain sailing. Except for the fact that some cows were being driven across the road into a field. And then, at the same farm, the next field, someone was taking some sheep down the road into the next field. Which is nice to see, but then I got stuck behind a logging truck for about 45 minutes. He turned off only for me to get stuck behind another learner driver and then a bunch of cyclists. So, needless to say, it was a pretty slow journey. But it's still nice to be on the road, and the scenery is, of course, amazing here in Scotland. The next trip is probably going to be NLS days in Sweden in about three weeks' time. Hopefully the plane doesn't get stuck behind a logging truck. Anyway, it's time to let you know who we have on the show this week. Our guests are Mike McCauley, CEO of Gate Neurosciences, Stephen Evans, CEO and founder of Oncolize, and Philip Markelin, Scientific Marketing Specialist at Three Brain. We also have our weekly chat with global commercial real estate services company JLL, and this week it's with Amber Shayada. And that means it's time for our look at the news that we've posted over at labiotech.eu. And again, there's a lot of it, so this is just a teaser. As I already mentioned, we had an article on our new events and conferences listings page. Marketing authorization has been granted for the treatment of serious retinal diseases, and Grid Biosciences signed an agreement with NIH for an Epstein Barr virus vaccine. Vilia emerged from stealth. An artificial intelligence-based algorithm is set to be used for the reporting of lymph node status in colon cancer, and scientists have unraveled the mystery behind a neurogenerative disease protein. Biotech incubators are scrambling to tackle a lab space crunch, and Back to Life received $5 million in new funding to address gut infections worldwide. A potential new cancer treatment target has been discovered by researchers in Sweden, Research also shows that TicoMed's ILB has the potential to treat neurogenerative diseases, including ALS. And we had an article on how CDMOs are keeping pace with trends in advanced therapies. Manus Bio received additional funding to fight malaria with biotech. A new discovery could lead to drug development for fighting brain cancer. And we had an article on proxy drugs. A study is set to start for an injection to treat schizophrenia. Brainomics has been awarded a tender to deploy AI stroke imaging across Hungary. And Provention Bio is looking to advance its diabetes drug after receiving a $125 million loan. Sanofi's first treatment in the US has been approved for adults and children with ASMD. Regulatory approval has been given to Iceland's EpiEndo for a study of COPD treatment, and an anti-cancer drug has been created from reprogrammed yeast. Researchers are trying to bridge the gap in the link between patients with salmonella infection and clogged arteries. A compound found in trees has the potential to kill drug-resistant bacteria, Researchers have identified a possible target for a type of sporadic ALS. 
United Biopharma received FDA approval for a Phase 2 HIV drug trial, and you can read all of these and many, many more at labiotech.eu. And that brings us to our first guest. Gate Neurosciences has officially launched to develop its next-generation therapeutics addressing synaptic dysfunction in patients suffering from central nervous system disorders. To tell us about the company and what it's doing is Gate Neurosciences CEO, Mike McCauley. So could you first tell me a little bit about the company? So we came together as a founding team three years ago, really recognizing both the need and the opportunity to build a next generation neuroscience company. So this space has really been overlooked by large pharma for the past 10 years. There was a serial exit of all of the major pharmaceutical companies from the space. Now, the science continued to progress forward, and that was something that we really wanted to seize that opportunity and bring it forward with Gate Neurosciences. So we began in 2019 in stealth with assembling our team and then began putting together some asset deals. So the first one was a deal with Eli Lilly for some MGUR23 antagonist programs that we were really excited about. They had been shelved at the IND stage in 2017, and those became the first assets to really nucleate the company around. They represented 30 years plus of research work at Eli Lilly, where they had been a leader in this space. And this was kind of the best in class compound that they had generated at this target to definitively test the clinical hypothesis around it. So we were excited to pick up that program. We followed that up a year later with the deal with AbbVie and Allergan for the legacy Norex assets. So a number of our founding team members were original founding team members of Norex, a predecessor company that was sold to Allergan. So when Allergan was acquired by AbbVie, those assets became available. We went in and were determined to really be the partner of choice to take the programs forward, finished that deal then in 2020, which brought on three clinical stage programs and a preclinical asset. So we've been busy at work the past year and a half then integrating these programs, getting our development plans together and you know battle testing it. And now really at the point where we're ready for prime time with the story. And so what kind of conditions are you going to be addressing and how will you be doing that? So our focus really is on synaptic plasticity. So the brain is very unique in its ability to repair and to be plastic. So this is important in a number of mental health areas, but also in areas of cognition. There are major needs. Obviously, COVID has only increased a lot of the needs in this space. What are the issues with treating some of the things that you're going to be looking at that make you want to do this? Yeah, so some of the classic issues in this space, and particularly in the treatment of mental health, uh, you know, depression and, and other indications has been the products have limited efficacy. So there's you know, well published stories at this point that demonstrate that up to half patients do not respond. So there's heterogeneity in the patient populations that makes it very difficult to determine if a patient's going to be a responder. But then with the time course that it takes, in addition to limited efficacy, it's the time to see effect. So a classic SSRI, SNRI therapy can take anywhere from four to 14 weeks to be able to see the signals of efficacy. That's just a long time, you know, and then you've got side effects that also come in. The side effects will come sooner than that. So that may be, you know, weight gain, sexual dysfunction, all discouraging the patient to continue on the course of treatment. So there's the natural social stigmas that come into play here with a lot of these uh, diseases and disorders where, you know, the patient has to first admit to themselves and then admit to a friend or a loved one, and then they need to go seek treatment where they're effectively starting a clinical trial of an N of one to see if they can find something that they will respond to. What we're really hoping to work on and where the field is really going is rapid acting agents, you know, really changing the treatment paradigm and trying to get into durable treatment responses, really affect the pathophysiology of the disease with specific mechanism of actions of drugs. So that's really what GATE was built to go after. Can you tell me a little bit about the novel mechanisms for addressing synaptic dysfunction? It sounds complicated. (laughs) <laughs> it is. It's, it's a little bit of secret sauce when you really get behind the science. And again, this is something that over the last 20 years and increasingly over the last 10 years, we, we now understand much more about these mechanisms. So some of the original understandings and appreciations around enhancing plasticity. So, you know, where the brain is really reaching out and making more connections within the brain structure. 
that a lot of those are mediated by NMDA receptor. So it's been efforts to try to target that as a critical junction point and some other targets. But a lot of these are difficult to target without some sort of off-target effect. So really the history of GATE and before it, Norex, dates back to Joe Moskal's work at the NIH, where he was running probes to look for memory and learning. And he identified some initial targets that were later understood to be an MDA receptor, which made a lot of sense. And it was a positive modulator. So the real course of then understanding what this mechanism was, the first generation asset Repastinol and then the next generation molecules that all work in the same mechanism of action. But they uniquely are a downstream mechanism relative to some recently approved agents such as Axome's product, but also Spravato and ketamine, which is all used. Those are all antagonist NMDA receptor antagonist programs. Those are now known and understood to work upstream on GABA interneurons. And as a downstream consequence, they cause activation of postsynaptic NMDA receptors. We're acting directly on those postsynaptic NMDA receptors. And then it is the downstream cascade from the postsynaptic neuron that creates the plasticity enhancement. The products themselves, could you tell me a bit about Celquistinol? Yeah, so Zelquistinel is really the crown jewel asset as a ideal oral properties for us to advance forward. It was also the subject of a large preclinical to clinical translation program at Allergan, most of which was not disclosed. This was all done inside at Allergan, and we are now the beneficiary of all of that data and are, are out now starting to publish that and disclose it a little bit more. So we spent a lot of time this year working and, and educating KOLs about this data package, which they responded to very favorably and were quite excited about it. So our next stage is now we're moving that into a confirmatory phase two study. So the Zoquistinel package included a robust preclinical looking in vitro activity, matching that up with in vivo efficacy, then working into clinical biomarkers in two human biomarker studies, and then a phase two dose range finding study that identified an efficacious dose. So we're using that whole data package now to move forward with the program and are quite excited with it. And what are the benefits to the patient of that product? So rapid action is one of the key attributes here where we're across all of the Stenel class of compounds, which Zelquistinel is a true third generation of this, we see a rapid activity. So you can see an effect within 24 hours, but you know, well documented within a week's time frame. We can also see durability of treatment effects. So that effect can last, you know, several days, if not a week out, as we've seen across the Stenel class. It really changes how we're treating these diseases to be able to have something where you see a rapid presentation of effect, and then there's not a need to stay on therapy. If you can have this durable treatment effect, you can think about migrating more to you know, the analogy we always use is what went on in the cancer space with targeted medicines, where the goal was to be very focused on the disease biology, address that and to treat a patient to remission and then bring them back if needed. So that's really the hope with a lot of these mechanisms now is to be able to help correct some of the underlying biology, get the patient stabilized and on a better course. And if need be, then they can come back for more treatment. Moving on, the next one is Rapastinol. Could you tell me something about that? Yeah, so Rapacinol was the first generation program uh, developed by Norex. In total, it's been taken into more than 2,000 human patients with a well-described safety profile, generally well-tolerated and placebo-like in all of its side effect profile. It had a mixed phase three experience. There were three pivotal studies that were run at Allergan, which failed. Our conclusion has been that dose selection and study design both contributed to those outcomes. There was a separate study, two studies that were run with an appropriate design, one of which used the correct dose range. And we saw a replication of the clinical results that Norex had generated in phase two. So we have a wealth of experience clinically with this compound that we're able to bring back a wealth of preclinical data as well. This has been a compound that was widely researched by a number of different independent labs. So we take all of that learning stuff that we're now able to apply to the other programs. Now we had a unique opportunity with Repastinel, given the safety profile that, that's been demonstrated with this and that we had access to a lot of material with this, that we're now working with investigators 
investigators and key opinion leaders on investigator initiated studies. So we'll have more to talk about in those areas in the upcoming months, but we have strong engagement right now with investigators to run some independent investigator initiated studies. And so what are the sort of timelines from where we are now to where you hope to be? Our plans right now have us in the next 18 to 24 months having confirmatory phase two readouts for our two lead Stenel programs, which which include apomostanil, the injectable second generation program, and then also zelquistanil, the, the full oral compound. How soon will this be over with and you you move on to something else? Well, you know, in this space, we're, we're working on other things too. We have, we have a robust pipeline behind this in the preclinical space and maintain some other interests that we're going into. We have research focused right now with our lead collaborators, Joe Moskal and Jeff Bergdorf up at Northwestern University. And again, we, you know, we're really broadening out our network in a true collaborative format within GATE. So our goal is to really continue to build the company out. You know, we know that there's a need for more companies focused in the neuroscience space. So, you know, both from a development research standpoint and then also commercially. So, you know, we're excited to take on this challenge, have a highly motivated team. So we'll see what the future holds for us. You know, we're really focused right now on the execution with our lead programs and then also advancing the preclinical programs behind them. Next, it's to a microchip that allows scientists to study the complexity of 3D cellular networks at unrivaled scale and precision. It's been developed by 3Brain, and to tell us about it is Philip Markelin, Scientific Marketing Specialist at 3Brain, who was talking with LaBiotech's Liza Laws. I'm here with Philip Markelin from 3Brain, and he has exciting news to share, so let's jump straight in. Good morning, Philip. Could you give me a bit of background on what 3Brain AG is about? Hey, good morning. So yeah, 3Brain is a Swiss deep tech startup working on cell electronic interfaces that link biological networks to computers via custom-made semiconductor microchips. And I know this is a mouthful, so uh, let me just give you the larger picture. So what we do, we build unique hardware devices and software solutions that empower life scientists to study information flows in cellular networks directly, with a current focus on biomedical and neuroscience applications. So what we work on is kind of an interface technology that spans multiple expert domains. So our team consists of life and computer scientists, as well as electrical and software engineers, we have a wet lab and the research team in Genoa, Italy, and an office and production facility here in Switzerland. The company's conception goes back somewhat like 15 years, and there has been a bit of academic history as well, with the first prototype developed in collaboration between the University of Genoa and the Swiss Research and Technology Organization, CSEM, which is still a current partner from us. So we, we very much have our roots in an in inter-European collaboration already. And even today, we, we try to keep the academic spirit when it comes to solving challenging problems and this drives a lot of our development. So over the years, we've worked and continue to work with academic scientists and industry research partners to create cutting edge technologies that will fit their research interests and needs. So we, we really like staying close to the science and pushing the boundaries of what is possible. And we have developed a range of products that we believe will usher in a new area of scientific exploration. So our devices have already been used in hundreds of scientific papers, and we have customers all around the world, and we are expanding a lot. And we are also now trying to break more and more into the pharma and drug discovery space. What exactly are cell electronic interfaces? What can, what can we imagine when you talk about connecting cells to computers? So yeah, electroactive tissues like, you know, the brain, the heart, the nervous systems, they are built up from networks of cells that communicate with each other by a rapid depolarization of their membrane potential. Some people might be familiar with like action potentials or spikes. And this is mediated by the opening and closing of voltage gated ion channels. So when ions flow, we have an electrical current and that creates a voltage when we bring electrodes in proximity. And this is basically the biosignals that we pick up on. And those biosignals, they are quite diverse. So for neurons, for example, we see everything between very fast firing events lasting half a millisecond to longer lasting field potentials, which aggregate over multiple neurons and that have bigger peak amplitudes. And usually these kind of electrophysiology experiments, they used to be super complicated. They would take up whole rooms of machines and many parameters were in need of fine tuning. And you would sit in a Faraday cage because of electromagnetic interference. And you will always be worrying about, you know, radiating devices and wires and how to ground them just to get 
to measure these very fine biosignals that come from cells between the mountains of noise that are around us, right? However, the recent miniaturization of electronics, especially in the semiconductor microchip technology industry, really helped shrinking down the electrodes to the sizes of individual neurons and opening up the space for engineering innovation. And this is basically where Sweetbrain comes into the game. So people are often surprised how small and elegant our devices are. I mean, they fit on the tabletop, right? They're not bigger than the kitchen scale of one of our products. So, And the power difference is staggering, like comparing modern day smartphones to 1960 computers. And very much like the smartphones today, our devices are way easier to use as well. These cell electronic interfaces that we have, they have thousands of sensory electrodes and they are spread over a few square millimeters. And then they have on-chip signal processing, noise filtering, you know, signal amplification. There's a lot of tech and design ideas in these microchips that are usually used like for other deep tech applications like high definition digital cameras or CPUs for computation. We just use them for biology. So it might sound a little bit like science fiction when you talk about cell electronic interfaces, but what it really means, it just means, you know, you bring thousands of sensory electrodes in proximity to cells to record the biosignals. And then we transform them into binary information, meaning into bits that can be interpreted by computers. And the whole concept also works bidirectionally, right? So meaning we can also use electrical stimulation to trigger, for example, neurons to uh, fire and depolarize. So how can researchers use your technology? What are the applications and scientific questions that can be addressed with them? One way to think of our, about our technology is like we're doing basically a new type of functional imaging, roughly comparable with optical optogenetic approaches, but without many of the limitations. Like we don't have a need for genetic manipulation. We don't have the problem of phototoxicity or photo bleaching. We also are not limited by temporal resolution or by parallelization. So we embed these sophisticated microchips that we created into plastic dishes used in cell culture and basically transform the cell culture dishes themselves into, intel into intelligent devices that are intuitive to handle for any life scientist, right? Everybody can use a, a six word plate, for example. And then so life scientists can culture and transfer their cells or biological model systems onto our dishes. We connect the dishes to our hardware devices and then immediately they get a high definition images of neuronal activity when you, for example, have neuronal cultures. And this is very much plug and play. So you don't need long preparation. We are not changing the biology of the cells or systems that we study. And this is important because biosignals are so fickle, right? We're recording the neuronal activity from thousands of neurons in parallel and in real time, all spatially resolved over a pixel array that we sample at 20,000 hertz, so 20,000 times per second. And this has, of course, a lot of application, for example, in the direct screening market, from phenotypic assessment of genetic manipulation to evaluating chemicals for neurotoxicity. And of course, you know, for preclinical drug discovery pipelines for neuroprotective or neuroenhancing candidate compounds. Maybe I should also mention that or emphasize that our technology is not just a pure high content screening. Because we do everything in real time, we can also do kinetic assays, which are of course, way better to observe transient effects. And this is much more interesting for people. We're not having endpoints. From the academic side, our collaborators using this technology, of course, to ask very fundamental questions about how cells communicate, how activi activity networks form, and how signals are propagated. Or just looking enough you know, for new biomarkers and understanding functional mechanisms of diseases. So it's really, it's a broad spectrum application technology. And the cool and important part from these interfaces is that they allow the researchers to you know observe intelligent networks at the scale and precision that we have previously not seen so in the end we are talking about spatially temporally resolved high resolution data of neural activity and that is big data so this is like by every dimension this is big data i mean the sizes of our recording they are, they are eye watering we have you know we have data scientists developing very smart compression algorithms to compress the data stream without losing critical information. And we have to employ software engineers that simplify the data management. And this is really something that a lot of our thinking also goes into to make it accessible for life scientists. And we also have dedicated machine learning scientists that build software solutions to kind of, you know, handle stuff like, you know, graph theoretic concepts like network topology so that they can become standard phenotypic assessments that life scientists can use without the users constantly having to reinvent the wheel 
But I mean, if you're going to details on that, that probably would fill another podcast. So there's a lot on the software side going on as well. Sure. Just this month, you have released a new 3D microchip. Can you explain to us what is so special about it and, um, and the problems it addresses? Let me just maybe spend a few sentences on brain complexity to give a bit of a round picture. So the human brain is one of the most complex things in the known universe, right? And current methods that are studying it either look at the very large, like fMRI scans, or look at the very small, you know, studying single neurons or a handful of neurons in culture. But what we are really missing is kind of the middle part. So where thousands of specialized cells act together and suddenly produce this emergent phenomena we associate with specialized brain functions. So neuroscientists call this sometimes the mesoscale. And at this scale, there's a complexity problem that keeps popping up again and again because neuronal tissues are one of these uh, of the most transcript anatomically diverse population of cells. They are embedded in this complex 3D cytoarchitecture and they form dynamically changing synaptic circuits. So it's just layer after layer after layer of complexity. And this makes the brain very difficult to study for neuroscience. As the audience might already know, recently scientists developed basically a new 3D model organisms or model systems to handle the complexities of the system and hopefully to study them in vitro. For example, there are brain organoids, but there's also, you know, organotypic tissue slices or multicellular 3D cultures. And these three model systems, they are super fascinating because, for example, you know, you can do long-term studies of brain organoids and they have shown that they've developed really into kind of mini brains in a dish and they develop specialized cell types, they reorganize their cytoarchitecture and you see the emergence the sudden emergence of neuronal activity and functional networks, as well as other developmental milestones. So these are really super complex, interesting model systems. But because they are so complex as a model system themselves, you know, researchers need new methods and devices to meet, you know, accuracy, precision, sensitivity, specificity, and repeatability requirements to measure and analyze and evaluate physiological relevant endpoints in these systems. And this is a bit where we come in. On top of that, one other problem that the system have is that because they are 3D, it's very hard to reach inside to get, you know, to where the interesting cells are. And this is true for all kinds of approaches, for microscopy-based approaches and also for cell electronic interfaces. In our case, we have to bring the electrodes close to the cells we want to study. Just to give you a bit of a round picture, sorry if this is a bit too extensive, but if you just think about organoids, you know, these are these round balls wrapped in extracellular matrix. And if you put them on a flat, on a planar surface, you would just have connection to a very few cells that are on the surface of that ball, and you really don't see what's going on inside. And the same is true for ex vivo brain slices. You know, these slices are like 200 micrometer thick, but when you cut them, you damage the outer cell layers. And so if you put them with the damaged layers on top of planar uh, electrode arrays, you will barely get any signals. And this is basically where we thought, okay, there is a need to develop something new. And this is where Acura 3D kind of came into play, which is basically this world first kind of 3D microchip we have been developing for years. And finally, you know, this month we can say, yeah, we, we can release it and, and, you know, talk about it. For Acura 3D, it's, it's also, it's a semiconductor based microchip that has, you know, thousands of sensory goat electrodes, and they are mounted basically on, on thousands of these biopolymer covered microneedles. Microneedles are kind of tiny pillars and the electrodes are kind of on the tip. And they only have like the fraction of a diameter of the human hair, and they can bypass basically damaged or surface cell layers and penetrate really deep into these 3D model systems without disrupting the overall cytoarchitecture. So it really means like, you know, we can retain full biological integrity and we have data to show that you can pop organoids on and off without breaking them and can measure basically the activity inside. And then there are some other innovations, of course, as well, because, you know, 3D system has other problems. They have very diffusion gradients. If you pop them on a planar surface, the cells at the bottom start to die, obviously. So also our chip, for example, we have added microfluidic channels to the chip, and this helps enormously to keep the motor systems viable and also helps for compound delivery because then the diffusion gradient from all sides is the same. And we already have shown that a 3D is vastly superior than flat technologies. Uh, scientifically, it's also super exciting because scientists want to look deeper into these organoids and there is just no comparable technology out there. And then we can really ask interesting questions, you know, why, where, how does spontaneous activity emerge in these brain organoids, for example, or how do brain waves start? And, you know, things like, does the cytoarchitecture actually shape the neuronal activity and network connectivity, or is it the other way around? And also when it comes to, you know, patients, right? 
I mean, if you derive organoids from at-risk patients and then you, you culture them and compare them to healthy patients, do you see differences? These are all things that scientists would like to study and the tools are very limited. And I think with the Acura 3D chip, we really have created something that will help scientists a lot to study these questions. Where will you go from here? Where will 3Brain go from here? Yeah, I mean, we are already working on new products, of course, and applications that we believe will empower researchers. I mean, that's that's our mission. And we also, you know, we think we are going to fill an unmet need in the pharma space. And the next logical step for us, of course, is to bring the 3D chip also to our multiple format so that we can use them for screening approaches more efficiently. And this has probably happened second quarter of next year. One of the biggest challenges we currently face is actually market awareness. So we have this amazing technology, we have cutting edge products, and many people have not heard about it, or they have not realized that they have a need for it. And so we really have to expand also our educational efforts. And so anybody who is listening right now, you know, and wants to learn more, please reach out. I mean, we, we have neuroscientists ready to talk to you to explain our technology because, you know, it's not done in five minutes. Like here, we, we have to talk a bit forth. We have to show the data and then people really, everybody, we show the data. They're like, wow, this is great. You have to start a conversation somewhere. You know, maybe one last thing. I think it's really cool to be part of this, right? It's not every day that a classic science fiction technology, like a cell electronic interface becomes, you know, a scientific reality. And I'm super happy that you invited us on this podcast to explain about the state of the art. I think this is great. And thank you very much. And now it's to some cutting edge developments in cancer treatment with Oncolize, which is looking to move OM301 into clinical trials. To tell us about the company and how it's tackling cancer is the Oncolize CEO, Stephen Evans. Hi, Stephen. Can you first tell us a little bit about the company? Ah, sure. Always a pleasure. So Oncolize was founded in 2011 by myself and several partners. We found a technology at Downstate Medical Center, which is based in New York City. And at the time we found this technology, it was almost a science project in an academic laboratory at Downstate Medical Center. And there was a significant amount of research going on about this particular technology, but it really had not advanced at all to the stage of being in drug development. So we found this technology. Uh, we knew the inventor and uh, he had told us about it. And we were so fascinated by the mechanism of action and the potential of this molecule at that time to be turned into a drug to treat many different types of cancers, that we actually formed a company around the technology to license the technology from the university and then take the molecule forward down the pretty arduous pathway of drug development to turn a science project into a deliverable drug. Could you tell me a bit about the lead drug candidate, OM301? So the technology itself, and what fascinated us was that this was a completely new approach to treating cancer. And I think that if this technology gets into market and if it actually can go ahead and cure patients and be widespread in medical treatment, that this has the potential to win a Nobel Prize in medicine. And the reason is, is that it's a completely new way of treating cancer treating a new target, which was discovered completely fortuitously by the inventor of the molecule. So I'll just give you a little bit of a history of how the drug was invented originally. So the inventor of the technology, Dr. Pincus, is an MD, PhD, Director of Pathology at Downstate Medical Center. And he obtained his PhD a degree up at the Cornell University in upstate New York. The laboratory that he was working in was run by Dr. Harold Shiraga, has uh, spawned off hundreds of different researchers, uh, postdocs, graduates from his laboratory. And his lab was really uh, focused on the mathematical modeling of protein folding. So Dr. Pincus was working uh, as a grad student in uh, Dr. Shiraga's laboratory, and he uh, had an idea to get a, a particular small peptide inside of a cell to treat cancer by causing the cell to shut down by a mechanism called apoptosis, which is a well-known mechanism. Cells basically automatically commit suicide. Uh, they turn off the lights inside one by one and they die over several days. So he wanted to develop a drug which would interfere with the intracellular mechanisms and essentially start to shut down cancer cells. So he had an idea for a particularly small peptide, but it's not easy to get a peptide inside a cell because you have something in between 
the blood and the cell inside, which is the cell membrane. And peptides are soluble in water, but they're not soluble in fat mostly. So getting a peptide across the cell membrane, which is mostly fat, is quite a complex process. However, there's a little trick to do that. There are these kind of Trojan horses, these small peptides that are soluble both in water and in fat, and can lead a peptide across the cell membrane. So he had this idea to attach this kind of Trojan horse small peptide to his peptide to get it inside a cell and then cause the cell to undergo apoptosis. He modeled it on the computer in three dimensions, like he thought it should look, and then he had some of that synthesized in a laboratory. Once he had it synthesized in a laboratory, he added the molecule to some cancer cells that were growing in a test tube in vitro, and the cancer cells died. Lo and behold, however, they did not die by apoptosis. They essentially blew up. And I like to say here that a lesser scientist would have said, ah, this doesn't meet my hypothesis, something's wrong with the mechanism, this is a toxic molecule, I'm going to go back and do something else. It took Dr. Pincus 10 years of dedicated laboratory time to figure out what the mechanism was. He sensed that something was going on. And what he discovered, and this is what I think is the Nobel Prize in medicine, if this gets into clinical use, what he discovered is that his molecule was not going inside the cancer cells like he had thought it would and causing apoptosis. It turns out that the target of the molecule, which is present in high concentrations inside almost all cancer cells, was actually being expressed on the extracellular surface, on the outside membrane of these cancer cells. So his drug was not going inside the cancer cell. It was actually getting caught on the outside of the cancer cell. And once it got targeted and caught on the outside of the cancer cell, it was acting like an ice pit to stab holes in the cancer cell membrane. And once you stab holes in a cell membrane, any type of cell, the cell absorbs water from the outside, and then it basically it pops like a balloon. It swells and bursts and explodes. So completely fortuitously, he discovered, and it took him this many years to discover this, he discovered a totally new phenomenon, is that this particular target of the drug which has been well-known and well-studied inside cells, and people have tried to target it and drug that target for many years. Unsuccessfully, the reason his drug was successful is it wasn't going inside the cell and causing apoptosis. It had a totally new mechanism, and nobody knew this target existed on the outside of cells. So that's what fascinated us when we came to Downstate and we saw the technology. We said, if we can turn this molecule into a deliverable drug, we have something potentially powerful here. And the reason that it's potentially so powerful is that it's very specific. It's targeted against a particular target, which is not found on normal cells. However, it's found on the outside surface of almost all cancer cells. We've looked at over 25 different cancer cell types, both hematologic tumors like leukemia, like lymphoma, like myeloma. We've looked at solid tumors, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, sarcoma. This is a ubiquitous target. And being ubiquitous, obviously, if we can turn it into a drug and deliver it to patients, has the potential to treat multiple different types of cancers. And how does it get to the various sites? I mean, would, would if somebody had cancer in several parts of their body, would it be able to track down all of those parts? Theoretically, yes. This is a, a drug which will deliver intravenously for the moment. It may end up in pill form someday, but for the moment, the plan is to give it intravenously. And once you give any drug intravenously, I mean, think about it. Think about standard chemotherapy. Pretty much all cancers have a treatment by standard chemotherapy, which is an intravenous treatment. So once you give a drug or any substance intravenously, it distributes throughout the whole body, and then it can have an effect wherever the cancer is. So we plan to distribute, you know, to give this drug intravenously. And we, in our animal testing, have seen the drug is effective both in liquid tumors and blood-borne cancers and also in solid cancers. So we have a lot of preclinical animal evidence that this drug can be very effective. So, uh, you know, you raise a good point. To have any kind of drug that works, you have to A, have the drug have a target. So it has to be able to find the target. Then it has to be deliverable and it has to get into the target. And then it has to have an effect on the target. So these are the three pillars of drug development, if you will. If you don't meet those three pillars, uh, those three criteria, you're unlikely to have a successful drug. Our drug does all those things. You can get it into the target, into the tumor. 
It can be selectively attached and it has an effect as well. Is it something that is just a one shot and you're done or is it something that has to be repeated to make sure that you get it all? Uh, that's a great question. So initially our plan, well, let me just step that back. We, we have a particular first cancer target in mind. And our first cancer target is acute myelogenous leukemia. It's a dreadful disease, no matter how you treat these patients. And there are lots of treatments out there. It recurs 75% of the time. The five-year survival is only 25%. And there's a desperate need for new treatments. So for our first clinical trial, we are planning to administer the drug on a daily basis, probably for 30 days. We may adjust that downwards, depending on how the patient's tolerated and what we see. But we think that a prolonged administration, especially if the drug is as non-toxic as we think it is, is the right way to go, because then we can you know, be more assured that every single cancer cell that's there will have been exposed to the drug and will be treated effectively by the drug. And this might be an equally ridiculous question in terms of you say that the cancer cells basically explode. What happens to that material? That's actually not a ridiculous question at all. That's one of the most important questions that you could ask. And uh, there are a couple of reasons that's an important question. So it turns out that indeed, if you destroy too many cancer cells at the same time, then the byproducts of the cancer cells that you've destroyed can glom up the system and uh, can overwhelm the system. That's, that's a well-known challenge in all cancer treatments. Uh, if you have a large tumor, if you have a high blood count of leukemia cells, you always want to make sure that you're going slowly. That's another reason that we'll go slowly on clinical trials. There are also protocols, which every clinical trial and every uh, patient who gets treated for any bulky tumor undergoes to prophylax against that. It's called tumor lysis syndrome. So this is a well-known phenomenon that you don't want to destroy too many tumor cells at the same time. So it's another reason to go slowly over a couple of weeks to a month. But actually, equally, if not more importantly, is that it turns out that the way you destroy a cancer cell is extremely important in terms of the body's own defensive mechanisms against cancer. So when you give regular chemotherapy, that usually shuts the cancer cells down by apoptosis. And we talked a little bit about that earlier. Apoptosis is a programmed cell death, essentially, where the cell sort of turns out the lights one by one inside and it reabsorbs itself. And that takes several days to do. When you destroy a cancer cell by apoptosis, the cell is absorbed by the body system and nothing really happens outside of the destruction of the cancer cell. But when you destroy a cancer cell by explosion, and the, uh, the uh, actual correct term for that is lysis uh, and necrosis. Uh, when you destroy a cancer cell like that, what you end up doing is you end up exposing the hidden cancer proteins that are residing on the cell surface of uh, cancer cells to the body's own immune system. So what you expect to see in that type of situation, and this is a well-known phenomenon, is a personalized immune response directed directly against the cancer that you're destroying. And this is a very exciting potential. Anytime you kill a cancer cell by necrosis and lysis, I mean, think about it. Why doesn't our body defend us against cancer cells and fight them off? And why doesn't our immune system recognize them? The reason is that cancers are typically very clever and they cloak themselves. They hide themselves from the patient's own immune system. So if you've got a technique that can expose those cancer cells to the patient's own immune system, not only can you have an effect of your drug against the cancer cells, but you rev up the patient's own immune system against the cancer. So you get a one-two punch. And this is another thing that's really excited a lot of the folks who have looked at our drug. It is extremely exciting. You mentioned the fact that you're starting out with the leukemia. Is this something that will improve that five-year lifespan, or is it potentially something that will rid them of this completely? Well, as doctors, as physicians, as well as scientists, we always hope for a cure. That is absolutely the goal. One of the things that has excited our leukemia specialists who are on our advisory board and others who we've shown it to, to be really enthusiastic about this potential treatment, this drug, is that not only does it treat leukemia cells that are circulating in the blood, but it also treats the leukemia stem cells that are hiding in the bone marrow. And this is why this drug has the potential for a cure. If you, you can knock down all of the circulating leukemia cells that are circulating in the blood, and the leukemia comes back again. 
uh, you can throw all the currently existing chemotherapy and targeted therapy, uh, even bone marrow transplant, against leukemia in leukemia patients, and it usually comes back again. And why does leukemia reoccur? And by the way, this is the same for many cancers. Many cancers have these uh, hidden stem cells. And if you knock off all of the, if you will, adult cancer cells, the stem cells bring the cancer back again. So any drug that can go after the cancer stem cells is kind of a holy grail of cancer treatment. And it turns out, and what we've seen in the research in our collaboration with City of Hope Hospital in California, is that our drug not only attacks the circulating cancer cells in the blood, but it also goes after those hidden stem cells that cause the recurrence of cancer in the bone marrow as well. So yes, we are absolutely hoping for a cure because of the effect, you know, we can potentially actually get rid of the cancer, not just palliate. And so where are you at in the hopefully short process? But sadly, <laughs> it's, they're usually long, but it's uh, uh, we'd yeah, like it to be tomorrow, I guess. Uh, but. We'd like it to be yesterday, actually. <laughs> Everything takes longer than, than you anticipate, of course. But we've had uh, a great deal of enthusiasm. We have, if you will, a lot of the car built. We have uh, our clinical sites picked out and ready to do our clinical trials. We have uh, had uh, a terrific interaction with the FDA. Uh, we had uh, submitted uh, to them our manufacturing and chemistry processes, and uh, they came back uh, basically uh, with no questions on uh, our pre-IND meeting. That's very important. It's very important to get off on the right foot with the FDA because the agency has a very long memory. <laughs> and if, you, if you don't get off on the right foot right away, it doesn't bode well. So we had a terrific first interaction. And really importantly, we just received this year what's called orphan drug designation for our drug for the treatment of acute myelogenous leukemia. And that's really, really important because that gives uh, market protection to the drug after it is marketed for seven years. So it really gives us a good amount of time to get this drug out there and uh, you know, gives us good potential for a really good return uh, on our investment in this product. And as far as looking into the future, hopefully all of this is extremely successful and it becomes a, a regular treatment. Is it something that you can produce at scale that you'd be able to distribute globally? Because there's an awful lot of people sadly have cancer. Right, absolutely. So the first step, and we did pass our manufacturing through FDA with the flying colors, and uh, we can manufacture in bulk. We know that. And, and manufacturing in bulk is not particularly expensive either. Of course, manufacturing the small amounts that we need to uh, uh, manufacture for a clinical trial is much more expensive. <laughs> but, uh, you know, once you get to mass production, uh, that's fine. So the first step is to go through what's called the phase one clinical trial. That will be in patients who have relapsed leukemia, who have failed treatment. And uh, we're anticipating that that trial will probably start in a, in a year and a half or so. We have uh, some work that we have to do. Uh, you know, FDA requires that you provide lots and lots of preclinical data uh, showing safety prior to getting into a clinical trial. So we're in the process of uh, working with uh, various different uh, companies that do this type of toxicity work to have a program that we can then submit to the FDA for what's called the IND number. That's the magic number, the, the investigational new drug number. That allows you to go forward with clinical trials. So our first clinical trial, we're anticipating somewhere between 20 and 30 patients to recruit with uh, AML. And that should be a fairly uh, rapid trial. Uh, you know, you talked about delays and things always go slower than expected, but because we're treating a blood-borne cancer uh, in our first clinical trial, we don't need a lot of fancy and expensive imaging like CAT scans and PET scans and, and, and such to follow the course of the patients. Basically, you take a blood test and see how the patients are doing. So we're anticipating that the trial will go you know, pretty rapidly for a cancer trial. We have uh, four top clinical sites lined up for the trial, including City of Hope, MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Mayo Clinic. So we're working with the top hospitals for leukemia. If the phase one clinical trial goes well and we have a good clinical result and good safety profile, uh, we would expand that trial. And the regulatory climate for approval of leukemia drugs is very favorable. You know, everybody's anxious to have new drugs out there. So some of these leukemia drugs that are out there, even if they're sort of partially effective, have been approved even after uh, what's called a phase 2B study. They haven't needed to go to a phase 3, really large study. So if we have good success in our phase 1, 2A trial, and if we have a good toxicity profile, we are uh, very much hoping that uh, a phase 2B could bring us actually to market approval. No guarantees, as with anything with the 
regulatory agencies and startups. <laughs> uh, you know, nothing is guaranteed. But from what we see in terms of the comparable companies and technologies out there, we're very enthusiastic about the potential. Must be one of those things where it's really exciting to actually go to work every day, knowing that this is a potential cure in the works. I mean, it's pretty exciting. Actually, it's really exciting. You know, I practiced medicine for many years and I got the entrepreneurial bug uh, during my medical practice and then segued off into uh, medical devices and then to uh, biotechnology. And, uh, you know, the way I, I see it, I mean, I'm a, I'm a physician at heart and, you know, in my clinical practice, I could do a few procedures a day and save a few lives a day. But if I can bring a drug to market that saves millions of lives, I mean, how great is that? And now it's to our weekly spot with JLL. And this week, it's Amber Shyada joining us to talk about a hot topic, and that's lab space. Hi, Amber. Thanks for having me, Jim. I'm excited to share a little bit about what we're seeing in the commercial lab market. As you may expect, commercial lab real estate has been in high demand as life sciences companies have expanded and scaled operations over the last two years partly driven by record venture capital funding, but also in some cases by strong revenue gains among some of these select public companies. Real estate investors have followed in similar, similar fashion, targeting opportunities within the sector as the appetite for alternative real estate investment opportunities has accelerated during the pandemic. Aggregate leasing activity across the top life sciences cluster markets reached a new high in 2021, exceeding 18 million square feet or about 15% of existing inventory. Through mid-year 2022, the momentum has continued, despite early indications of macroeconomic challenges starting to play out in some pockets, but leasing volume reached nearly 8 million square feet at mid-year this year, so it's keeping pace with last year, almost. Developments underway or being converted totaled nearly 27 million square feet at the middle of this year, 40% of which have already been pre-leased or pre-committed to. When including planned and proposed projects, that development volume swells to 70 million square feet. Some of these planned and proposed projects will probably be on hold until uh, macroeconomic conditions start to uh, uh, flatline a little bit. And this will certainly uh, mitigate any oversupply risk in the sector. But again, we haven't seen this much speculative development in the sector ever before. And it's really just points to how much demand we've seen in the sector. Rapid tenant growth has really driven investors and developers to move quickly in order to capture this demand because a lot of these companies really need to have that speed to market in order to continue their science and continue to grow. A majority of leasing activity in the last two years was driven by expansions and new leases, accounting for nearly 62% of leasing volume in the lab market. Some tenants may have oversubscribed a little bit on lab space and are starting to put some of this excess space in the slub lease market. The recent activity is not all unexpected because the scarcity of supply and the competitive environment last year drove some tenants to overcommit with intentions to release a little bit of that space to the sublease market for a short period of time, which is what we're starting to see now. But a lot of these companies have plans to reabsorb it as they continue to grow and expand. So this added space can offer some relief for growing tenants who are still facing a very tight and competitive scarce lab market. The top life sciences clusters in aggregate recorded a lab vacancy rate of 5.6% at the middle of this year. And this is very tight. Market e equilibrium is generally when vacancy is between eight to 10%. So some of the subway space coming online is really helping to alleviate that pressure and creating opportunity for tenants. New development, scarcity of product and active tenant demand drove rents to all time highs in, in these markets as well. The core life sciences clusters saw rent soar above the market average of 78% dollars per square foot. So in Boston, East Cambridge, asking rents are about $125 per square foot at a triple net rate. And in UTC in San Diego, uh, rents actually grew the highest in the last two years at 69% since 2019. So average rents there are about $88 per square foot. So the pace of rent growth has been pretty rapid, but it's anticipated to slow a little bit since there's a potential slowdown coming, but still will remain elevated and very strong overall, which again is another challenge for tenants who are looking to save on costs. The most mature market clusters are generating the greatest level of tenant demand and investment activity, but we've also seen a lot of expansion into emerging markets. A lot of institutions, universities, and local communities are trying to invest in the development of innovation communities. 
And so investing in uh, infrastructure, talent pipelines, and incubator space in some cases is going to provide more opportunities for growing startups and more markets for them to choose from. Um, and in the long run, this is great for local communities because the more markets that can capture the growth of this life sciences industry uh, are really planting the seeds for, for future growth and innovation over the long run. Great. Thanks, Amber. Look forward to talking to somebody from the company again next week. Amber Shayada is the head of life sciences research in the Americas for JLL, a global commercial real estate services company shaping the future of real estate for a better world. Amber has more than 13 years of real estate experience, and she specializes in real estate economics, industry trends, and real estate forecasting. And that's it for another podcast. Next week is the unlucky number 13, so I'd better make absolutely sure I get the interviews done. In the next few weeks, we are going to be having previews of a couple of events that I'm attending. So that's NLS Days in Sweden and Bio Europe in Germany. And of course, that's an opportunity to remind you again of our new events listings page at labiotech.eu. And also, if you're going to be at one of those events, it's also an opportunity to say hello. I'll be the disoriented, tall, bald guy with all kinds of microphone cables hanging off me. Although it may be easier to just get in touch in advance and set something up. But we're always happy to hear from you, whether it's for an interview, with some news, an event listing that we missed, or really any reason at all. Except spam. We get enough of that already. And so, I'm looking forward to the next six days of rain that we have forecast here, and I hope wherever in the world that you are, you have a great week ahead. Thanks for listening, and please join us again next time for another Beyond Biotech. <music>